Well, good morning and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. I am Maya McRae and I'm the MSYP for Inverclyde. And I'd just love to welcome you all to the 2024 Festival of Politics. This year celebrates the festival's 20th year of provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages from every walk of life to engage in five days of spirited debate. I look forward to this discussion and hearing from everyone's thoughts and views. It's important that everyone is given the opportunity to contribute even where there may be differences of opinion and that we treat each other respectfully at all times. We are delighted you can join us to participate in the Mental Health and Young People's yeah, Mental Health and Young People in partnership with the Healing Arts Scotland and the Scottish Youth Parliament. And later I will be inviting you to get involved in some questions and comments if you wish to do so. If you're keen to throw your thoughts out there, you can, do, you can, do, blah, you can do so using the app Visit Scottish Parliament on Instagram or Twitter. And I should also add that this event is being recorded and will be available on the Scottish Parliament's YouTube channel shortly. Now we're going to be talking today about young people's mental health and we understand that this topic can be sensitive. However, it is a very important one. Your well-being is the most important thing here today. So I am going to run through some housekeeping to make sure everyone feels safe during and after this panel. Firstly, I would like to point out some context warnings that will be in place throughout today's panel session. The topic of mental health can cover a lot of things, including mental health problems such as anxiety, depression, self-harm and suicide. None of our planned questions will address specific mental health problems directly, but they may come up in the course of our discussion. We may also discuss other topics which you may find difficult, including young people's experiences and conflict situations. If you are asking a question later on in the session, we would ask that you do not share your own direct experiences of mental health problems in case this is triggering for others. If you feel overwhelmed or distressed at any point during today's panel, please do, please do feel free to take a break or leave the session. There's a designated quiet room just off the garden lobby. Please find a member of the Festival of Politics staff if you need help finding this room. I am very pleased to be joined here today by Fiona O'Sullivan, Dr Joe Inchley and Sangeeta Ishavaran. Fiona Sullivan is the Director of the Children's Wellbeing for Edinburgh Children's Hospital Charity, supporting children, young people and their families both in hospital and in the community. For almost 30 years, Fiona has worked within the arts and health, supporting disadvantaged children, those with physical health conditions and those struggling with their mental health by using creative interventions. Having experienced the positive effects the arts and creativity can have on mental health and wellbeing, Fiona, through ECHC, has recently opened The Haven, a children's mental health support service based in East Lothian. Dr Joe Inchley is the co-lead for Schools Health and Wellbeing Network at the University of Glasgow. Dr Inchley is a behavioural scientist and public health researcher specialising in child and adolescent health. Her current research focuses on adolescent mental health and the role of schools in health improvement, drawing on social, economical and systems perspectives. Other research interests include adolescent physical activity, sleep, social media, use and spiritual health. Her previous roles include Deputy Director of the Child and Adolescent Health Research Unit and Senior Research Fellows at University of St Andrews. And Sangeeta Ishvaran is the founder of the Wind Dancers Trust and is a dancer performer who developed the Shadri? Katradi. I tried, I really tried. <laughs> um, methods working in marginalised, underprivileged communities using arts and education empowerment and conflict resolution across 30 countries. She's been honoured with the highest national awards for young dancers as long as as well as many more and she's a fellow of the International Institute of Constellation USA and is an honorary associate of the Na Nature Conser Conservation Foundation India. Speaking eight international languages she has taught in over 20 universities and international organisations. So thank you so much for just joining me today. I'm really excited. <laughs> Now, before we get into the discussion, I thought I would ask the panellists a wee icebreaker. So we are four very busy, and I would quite rightfully say successful women, and to do what we do and to get up early in the mornings and travel about the world, we absolutely need to have breakfast. Mm -hmm. So I thought I would ask, how do you prepare for a day like this? I'll start with you. Oh, thanks. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I think, well, my go-to breakfast is, it sounds really boring, it's just like yoghurt, fruit and probably granola sprinkled on the top for a bit of a treat. But uh, that's my go-to, keeps you going until lunchtime. <laughs> no, I'm the same, yeah. I love granola. Yeah, love I know, it. It's <laughs> Can't go wrong. Morning, everybody. Um, nice to be here and see you all. So I have to get two teenagers out of the house to school, so my breakfast is always a little bit rushed in the mornings. <laughs> so it's tea and toast for me with a bit of raspberry jam. 
Hello. Nice to see everyone. Um, in India, I would be eating millets. It's like a porridge that's very protein rich. Here it was cereal and yogurt. <laughs> so Solid choice. Not all great choices. Um, I work in a coffee shop, so my breakfast, breakfast usually is like a double espresso. Um, <laughs> just being honest. But I also love like fruit toast, like toast with like wee cranberries and stuff in it. Keeps me going. So the first proper question that I would love to ask is what initially interested you in the relationship between the arts and young people's mental health? And what's been your favourite thing about being involved in this space? So can I start with you, please? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, I started my career in Liverpool and I was working with disadvantaged young people. A lot of um, the young people were um, dealing with knife crime and drug and alcohol addiction. And we would take groups of young people on residentials and we would introduce them to arts. And my background is music. So I would go and I would do songwriting courses um, and we would work with the young people. And it was just... I mean, I came, my background was music. I had no idea that arts and health was a thing at this time. Um, but when you saw these young people transform, and these were kind of, you know, tough young men, really, and they would start just, you could see them starting to relax, and we would just go, what do you want to talk about? What are we going to write about? It was rapping. I did a lot of rapping. You know, not my forte, but you do what the young people want. Um, and they wanted to create these raps and they would then, as the, as the process started to develop, they would open up and, and start telling you about their experiences. And it was mind blowing for me. It was such a privilege that these young people were starting to really open up and talk about life in a gang, what it was like to have to deal with hierarchies and when you're being brought into those gangs and being groomed essentially. Um, and for me then just seeing that they were able to talk through songwriting and express what they were going through gave us a platform to then start an intervention that could support them to, to, to live a more healthy life. And that's when the interest really sparked for me. It was, it was giving those young people an opportunity to, to step away from what they were experiencing. And I just the power of, of music being able to do that for me was just amazing. So that's where it all started for me. Fantastic. See, I'm, I'm the same actually, because I'm also a musician apart from doing all this kind of stuff. And like, I totally know what you mean by like, when you do go, th go through something or you've got something on your mind, music is a complete outlet for that. Because I mean, in a way it is poetry, if you're songwriting yes. yeah. and then you're putting music to it as well. So totally get that, totally get it. Yeah. So I'm a mental health researcher, not an art specialist, if you discount sort of grade three clarinet. Um, so I'm interested really in what we can do to better protect and promote young people's mental health. So we know that mental health services are bursting at the seams. So we really need to look beyond health services and see what else we can do for young people to really give them the skills and, and coping skills and abilities to manage the stresses they deal with every day. So I think the arts is a, is a brilliant um, example of that and provides a whole range of opportunities for young people as they develop and grow through childhood and adolescence to really understand themselves better and engage with the world and others. So, so for me, that's where I'm coming from in terms of the arts as an, as an opportunity to really support young people's health and well-being, particularly during the adolescent years where the majority of mental health problems emerge. Um, so I started out life as a Bharatanatyam dancer and it's a form of classical Indian dance from Southern India. And, uh, but I always used to volunteer because I had a lovely teacher and a mother so I, we used to dance in orphanages, in old age homes, in temples. We didn't really, I think I was 18 or 19 before I danced in a proper theater. So having this upbringing, um, my first time actually looking at the arts as a way to, to bring problems out was actually pretty late because I always thought, oh, you're giving them a little bit of comic relief. They're getting a little bit of joy. You know, you're dancing with them for an hour and they're happy and you go. It was more like entertainment versus the value of that art brings in. So I was in Cambodia and I was 25 when I had my first, I didn't plan to have this project. I was there to study class, classical Cambodian dance, uh, which is related to Indian dance. And um, I was getting a stipend and I was drowning in guilt because it was post Khmer Rouge. It was a war 
you know, and you would see poverty everywhere. And it, coming from India, I'm so sensitive and perspective. The haves and have nots are rubbing shoulders all the time. And so I started just dancing with a bunch of kids on my road. Just down my road, there was this little open space. But then after a few weeks, I saw them in the evenings with old men in pubs. And I realized that they were part of sex trafficking. And I was so taken aback. I didn't know what to do as a person who didn't even speak the language, I had just come into the country, right? So I asked around and people told me, don't, don't uh, interfere because a lot of it is political. You can get into trouble, you can get shot, you can get deported. So I started doing what we normally do when we see difficult situations. You can't engage, you try to avoid. So I tried to avoid them. But these little kids would come running up on the street and say, Nikru, Nikru, which is like teacher. And they loved all the Bollywood stuff we were doing and you know, so I said, you know what, at least dance with them. It was really, really hard. But over the next few months, I really saw how movement, because it was completely nonverbal, unlike you. I was in a place where I didn't speak the language at all. I started speaking some French, um, but my Khmer was just bits and bobs. And I saw the power of what understanding what the body can do how you can open up a space, how you can deal with trauma in a very nascent way because I didn't have the tools. This is more than 25 years ago, right? And there was nothing called arts and health. Arts and health wasn't a thing. Nothing was a thing. Dancers were just performers. We were the notch girls a lot of the times, you know? So I started seeing that I could build strong connections between them to support each other. They were building coping skills. Like I would bring in snacks because they were moving about and you said, okay, the least I can do is bring in some snacks and get them some food. And the first few weeks they would be grabbing for it because they didn't know if someone else would get it and I wouldn't get it. But then we started playing little games where you would take it, but you had to give it to someone else and exchange it. So you build in these small things and the power of giving. You can even just give someone a biscuit. It's a power, right? And then, so the bonding, the coping skills and then advocacy. We built a small performance. I got a couple of friends and NGOs involved and some of the kids started coming out because it has to be a choice. Because the entire family is involved in this. You can't just pull the kid out and say, you know, now I put you in a safe space. It has to be a choice. So I learned so much and actually I was just learning Cambodian dance. It's years later that I, it took me time to figure out that there was something powerful happening here. And I started getting more and more involved, people with HIV, you know, in the early 2000s. Um, I know that there were cocktails of drugs being developed in the West, but in Cambodia and in India, you just died. You didn't have access to anything, you know. Um, people who have the sex trade, sex workers, street children, then I started working with children in conflict, all the while having my career in dance. So I had two separate CVs. One was my proper dance career because theater directors didn't want to know of my community work that made you less of an artist. You were not a true artist. And people in NGOs or community work, if I said I was a performer, that made me not a serious social worker. I'm just a volunteer. So I had this double life going for a while till COVID came and I said, you know what, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm just like going to put it all together. If you like me, like it all, all the bits and bobs of things. Self-discovery is just amazing. Like instinctively you felt that the art and the, the joy that you had to share with these people would be beneficial. Even as you were saying, like mental health and arts, that wasn't a thing, that wasn't a saying, but yet you instinctively knew. And I just think that's, that's amazing. Like that's exactly what we need. And there's so many people in the world that have exactly what you've got and more and less. And there's so many people everywhere, but they aren't, there isn't those facilities to actually be able to say to the children, the young people, this might help you. There's those communication barriers. So I just think that's great. The next question that I want to touch on is what do the arts mean to you? And what potential do they think they have to develop a positive mental well-being? And I think you've already kind of gone into that of what you think the potential is. Um, but for Dr. Inchley, obviously you work on the research side of things. So what do you, where do you, where could you see this going? Yeah, so I think, I mean, we talk about arts and health and in the context of mental health, I think there's opportunities around supporting children and young people who have a formal diagnosis. There's good evidence emerging around 
the value of arts therapies, drama therapy, dance therapy and so on to support those young people. I suppose from my perspective, I work a little bit more around public health and prevention and early intervention. And obviously, the majority of young people today who are experiencing mental health issues will not have a formal diagnosis. And it's really important that we recognise their needs and often their hidden, hidden needs. Um, obviously, anyone working in a school context will tell you that they're dealing with that day in, day out. So there's a huge group of young people for whom there's a need for mental health support, but they're not accessing mental health services. And I think that's where something like the arts can really come in. So it's obviously it can be a therapeutic tool on one, on one hand, but I think it's also really valuable as a preventive tool and looking at how we can therefore provide those opportunities universally to young people as they grow through childhood and adolescence. I mean, we're creative beings, right? I mean, if you watch young children play, you see that creativity at work and then they start school. <laughs> and then somehow our education system kind of suppresses manages to suppress creativity and we lose the opportunity for young people to go and develop those skills. So I think looking at how we can integrate the arts throughout child development to improve health and well-being is a really, is a really important area to explore. Absolutely. And when you're saying that when children enter school, that's almost slightly diminished. Do you think the solution to that would be more investment, more funding? Or do you think there's actually an issue within our education system in the West that just doesn't facilitate that space for young people? Yeah, there's a lot of debate going on at the moment around kind of education and how we approach education. And I think we have become a little bit too focused on exams mm. and, ed and educational attainment to the loss of creative arts and individual expression. So I would like to rethink how we do education in the UK and in our Western countries, I think that would be really, really valuable. So there is a need for investment, but there's also a need for sort of looking at the systems around us in which children are growing and living and, and learning. And there's real opportunities just to kind of shift those cultures, to, to shift the priorities and recognise the value of some of these kind of broader areas um, of learning. Absolutely. And if you don't mind, I'm going to touch back to Sangeeta. So obviously the, the education system in Scotland and the UK, it's actually different. Scotland and England are different and we are right next to each other. So in India, um, what does the creative education look like for young people and do you think, do you think it works? No creative education no. in schools. But the beautiful thing in India is the arts are very valued. So I learned dance all my life because my mother just sent me to a dance class near my house. So children have a lot of exposure to the arts because our teachers and gurus are are all over the place and you have many many forms of arts that your village will will engage in or your community will engage in but having said that um, what I work I work with the education system as well as the health system I'm actually I feel a bit of an imposter here because I don't work with mental health directly I work with social transformation so when I'm working with young women for example a small trigger warning I think many of you know that uh, there is a rape case in India that has been publicized enormously. There are many that hardly come out, but women face a lot of sexual harassment and attack. You know, in, I, if I walk into a room with Indian women, I would know 100% that everybody has faced non-consensual touch on some level, you know. Um, so when you're looking at that and you're looking at how is the school system equipping you to deal with it, you're also looking at young men who've experienced a lot of abuse. It's not just women and you're looking at the entire gender spectrum because we don't have that uh, you know, understanding right now. We are in a very colonial understanding of what gender is. We have not moved, though traditionally we had a different understanding. So we bring in what we call uh, life skills development we bring in sex education. I can do sex education without mentioning the word sex because sex, you're not supposed to talk about it, which is why we have 1.5 billion people in India right now. We don't talk about it, we just do it, right? So looking at that scenario, one of the pillars of my work is shame. And this work started with the work I started in sex education and sex abuse education with children. We call it CSA, child sex abuse education. But I realized how much from birth Babies by six, eight, nine months, even a year, they know that they are always told to cover up certain parts of your body. You don't name those parts of the body. You give little pet names. You don't have a pet name for your hand, so why do you have a pet name for a penis? Right? So children understand very, very early on that certain parts of the body are not to be mentioned. They are shameful. 
This is very strong in India. I don't know how it is with you. So when we are doing our classes, we start with enormous joy and we work on breaking inhibition and shame. We are rolling on the floor. We are doing activities that you normally don't engage in, ways to touch that you normally don't, uh, you know, do it. So you're opening your creative side, you're opening up your body spaces, and you're working with shame. If we don't lay this base out, whether you're working with conflict, whether you're working with sex abuse, whether you're working on gender-based violence or alcoholism or substance abuse, it doesn't matter. Your groundwork has to be in shame and then fear. And unless you create, we call it shameless spaces, besharam. Um, in India, you say a sharmi ladki. Someone who's uh, shy is sharam. She is shy, and it's good. And if she's not shy or modest, she's shameless. Most Indian languages, you have this dichotomy, right? If you're not shy, you're shameless. So shame is related to the body, and it, it sits in our bodies. And this is the fun part. I thought the West had amazing sex education, you know, <laughs> that you guys are teaching your kids, you have sex ed classes, it's part of your curriculum. I'm now helping friends in France design sex education curriculum in the US. Because it's not about learning about sex. I can talk about sex in 10 seconds, penis, vagina, semen, egg, getting together, baby, boom, done, right? It's about understanding how we grow with shame around these relationships and how do you build healthy relationships, friendships. And how do you build consensual relationships? I mean, I would completely agree. I work really closely with Sandyford, who are kind of like our sexual health NHS sector, if you will. Um, because in Inverclyde, we had a Sandyford clinic and it wasn't promoted. And I, with working with young people, try and kind of reduce that shame when it comes to sexual health. Because a lot of that shame is linked directly to mental health issues. And we know that, and I don't really need to even say that right now. Um, but a lot of it as well with adolescents going through these teenage years is when you're kind of finding out more about yourself, your body's changing. It's kind of when you're most changing. Um, and our sexual health education is is on the ground. Like, it's, it's terrible. Um, so I try and do a lot of work to reform that, and a lot of young people collaboratively with me do a lot of work to reform that but it's still very in the first second stages there's so much needing to be done because as you said you can talk about sex in two minutes and that's fine and you're done and that's what a lot of people experience you know and I was actually talking yesterday that when I went through that education the boys and girls were segregated and it was like girls this is going to happen to you boys this will happen to you and we had to debrief together in the playground to be like oh by the way what's happening to you guys because we're doing this um and I think it's awful and it's you know, it's not just India, and I think there is kind of this this reputation for the West being very liberal and free, but within our education system, it absolutely isn't. Do you see hints of that in your line of work? Do you see kind of the negative impacts of that lack of education influencing young people's mental health? Um, lack of education within, within um, sexual health? Well, or... I mean that, but as well as everything, because we were kind of touching on the education reform that is kind of slightly needed. So, relating to the arts as well, to bring it back to why we're all here. Um, I was saying in relation to the arts that I think the problem with the education system um, and where the, as you were saying, creativity just stops as soon as you kind of go into school is because the teachers aren't professional artists. Um, and what we need to be doing is either working with, um, you know, student teachers to kind of go, these are the new arts techniques that you're doing. Because I think what is most terrifying is when you're told, right, we're doing art today. And for me, my heart sinks when people say we're going to do an art workshop, because for me, that's just painting and drawing. And those are skills I do not have. And it fills me with fear and terror. Um, whereas I went to an absolutely fantastic workshop on Tuesday at the, um, at the Portrait Gallery. And they said, right, we're going to do an art workshop. And my heart sank. And then the artist, very skilled, fantastic from the gallery went right there's lots of different colored tape now just kind of rip that tape up stick it down on the table however you want it to be this is art and you are creating and you are choosing color and you are choosing design and you can choose whether you want that your work to blend with somebody else's work but make sure you ask first and you go for me that is art it was accessible art it was um something that drew us all together and it created a, a lovely relaxed space where we could talk to each other 
where it broke down those barriers where you're kind of sitting in your little space and maybe if you were, had just a piece of paper you were just drawing on that. So I think we need to educate people into um, or, or work with our teachers and educators to actually go actually there are different ways to deliver art it doesn't just have to be paper and pencils and drawing and paint art is so broad and it's so wide that you know we need to really be we looking at the whole spectrum of the arts rather than it just being visual art um, so I do think there's a lot of work that we can do because then that's going to encourage young people's creativity throughout their lives. And I think that's what we need to be doing, especially if we're looking at arts and health and the health benefits of the arts. We need to be ingraining that into the young people's lives from a young age so they go home and they practice these arts techniques at home as well as in schools or in their work or wherever they want to. Absolutely. To do it. And I mean, that actually brings home perfectly to a question that I was going to ask later on, but I think it's more relevant now. Um, Article 31 of the United Nations Conventions of the Rights of the Child, UNCRC, states that all children and young people have the right to leisure, play and culture. All children and young people have this right, but we know that different groups of young people face different barriers to accessing the arts. So when you touched on accessibility, obviously, if you like myself and like yourself can't draw can't paint and just dread the thought of it that's not accessible art is you know like accessing that kind of creativity within schools especially is no longer accessible to you what do you think we could do to improve that accessibility throughout all sectors um i think oh i think that's quite hard um <laughs> Or do you think, think there's yeah. anything we can do? Like, is there... Yeah, I mean, there's always things we can do. And I think it's just around introducing people to other arts. So in the hospital, we have one of the biggest paediatric arts programmes in the UK. And we bring lots of different artists into the hospital. Um, because you might have some people who are really into music. You might have some young people who are really into visual arts. You might have some people who are into dance. We don't know what these young people are. We do consult and we ask. But initially, we'll kind of knock on doors and go, would you like to take part in this activity? We're doing music today. And the young people can choose whether they want to take part. And actually, in a hospital setting, that's really powerful, just to have that level of choice. Um, a lot of young people, when they find themselves in a hospital setting, their, their choices are taken away from them. They are told when they have to eat. They are told when a procedure is going to get done and they ha it has to happen. There is no choice. Um, so for us knocking on a door and saying, would you like to take part in this activity, um, gives them that choice, gives them a power. And if they want to say no, that's their choice and that is their power to say no. If they want to take part, brilliant. Then we can say, what interests you? We can find out what those young people want. We can ask them, you know, you know, is it sports? It might not be the arts that we're, we're working with. The young people, not all young people are interested in, in the arts, but it's finding that thing that the young people connect with, whether that's sports or science or creativity. And we tailor that experience to that young person and we use that tool, whether it's the sport or the science, to then start engaging and we can build creativity from that. But it's finding the spark in that young person's, you know, finding the interest that sparks that young person. And I think that's what we have to do. We have to listen to what the young people need and want and what interests them. And we have to tailor activities and work around what their needs are, because that's what's going to help grow creativity and 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 good mental health for those young people and to practice them later on in their lives. And I don't know whether I've just gone off on one or whether yeah. I've answered your question or not. No, I think sheets. you have. I think you have. And I think it, needs, it leads me quite nicely to ask. So the research side of things, you're saying we need to listen to young people. We need to know what they want. You obviously work alongside a lot of the data. Do you know what that is? Can you identify where the problems lie and, and if there is any tangible change that, change that we can do? Or is it a bit more vague at this point in time? It's not necessarily vague, it's complex. <laughs> and it's going to be different for different young people in different communities. So how you approach it is going to be different. I think coming back to sort of child rights is really interesting and, and the issue of inequalities and in access to um, arts experiences and opportunities is really, really important to recognise and try and address. And it's not easy to know how to address that. So that's... That's an important issue, but I mean, especially in the context of mental health, which we know is are strongly patterned by socioeconomic status, for example. So young people growing up in more deprived areas do report much worse mental health. 
And poverty is a major driver of that. And poverty also stops young people from accessing opportunities like the creative arts um, and other things, other sort of supports and resources which will help support their own mental well-being. So we do need to address inequalities. We do need to look at working with young people. And I think that's fundamental here. Often we look at sort of professional um, solutions. But actually what young people want is the agency to make decisions about their own lives and to tell the adults what it is that they need, want and need. So we, we need to work in partnership um, with the young people within their communities to look at lo local needs, to look at lo local opportunities and make sure that they are available to, to all. Absolutely. And also, I would just like to say a nice warm welcome to our guests that joined us kind of midway through the session and to let you know that we will be doing a bit of a QA. and a So if you've got any questions, any comments that you would like to share with us, and this is a reminder to everyone, um, there will be the opportunity to do so very shortly. So just keep thinking about it. Um, but quickly, before we get on to that, so obviously I'm an MSYP, member of the Scottish Youth Parliament, and what the Scottish Youth Parliament does is basically branching that gap between the Scottish Parliament and lots of different agencies and young people so that there can be that communication because it, it's vital. Like, there's no point in adults deciding in rooms similar to this, round a big table, this is what young people need because it's proven time and time again that it's just not, it's not what we need. Um, do you think, so obviously when you... To be an adult, you have to have been a child, but times are changing. And when we're doing studies, we're always looking at young people. What do you want? What do you want? But do you think that it would actually be worth our time to look at people who are maybe between the 20 to 30 bracket to see you were a young person not that long ago? Mm -hmm. Young people extends up to 25. So we're talking five, 10 years. What would have helped you 10 years ago? Yeah. Or do you think that the times have changed so much that what would have been relevant to them is now no longer relevant due to like social media and different cultures? And I'll open it up to you. What do you think? Because you've travelled everywhere, so you've seen so many different people and cultures. And most, most of the spaces I work in are intergenerational. Uh, I think it's a privilege to live um, in a community where you tend to meet only people of your age group. It's, it's a very Western phenomenon. So if I'm working with uh, in re refugee camps or in orphanages or in, you know, in community work. Uh, in the same space, if you're working with young women who are mothers at the age of 16 or 18, you'll also have the babies around, you'll have the grandmothers coming in to help out, you'll have, you know, it's very intergenerational. So it is not, it is not, um, it is not unusual to have multiple points of view coming into your room, which is great, you know. But having said that, social media is not such a big thing, again, in the communities I work with, because very like in, during COVID, two years, children had no education because they had no devices. You don't have that many devices in a family. So it's a very different setup that we are looking at. But of course, young people are engaging with, we don't have TikTok in India because of the China, you know, the, the, the fight going on now. But we have Insta and Facebook or whatever. I, I'm not engaged because I don't even have electricity half the time, forget an internet connection or a phone connection. So it's not such a big thing. But having said that, I think young people everywhere, uh, whether you are 10, 20, I think even older people, what we need to build are coping skills and resilience. So what, we is, what I look at a huge part of my work is emotions. And again, it comes back to the body. If you're really angry, you know, where does that manifest in your body? Just think of some, something that triggered you this morning or yesterday. Immediately your stomach might hurt a bit or your throat might shut, you know, or you might get a slight headache, you know. So getting all of us to watch ourselves, where are our emotions manifesting and then how can we breathe our way out without looking only at the rational part of the brain, which says, if you have this problem, if I am upset with you, that if we sort it out, then the problem is solved. No, I will just get upset with someone else because it's inevitable. We are going to get upset. But if I know that whoever I'm upset with, I can take a step back, not give way to the anger, give way to violence, and then I can take care. That, is, that doesn't depend on what generation you belong to. We all need these skills. And the younger you learn them, the better. Absolutely. Right? So these, this is the kind of stuff that we're trying to do. Locate your emotions, learn to handle them, be gentle, be compassionate. And it can be fun. Compassion is not just for old Buddhist monks, right? You don't have to shave your head to be compassionate. Uh, we do these really funny kindness challenges 
And like I said, a whole variety of people usually engage because you walk into a refugee camp or into a slum. People everywhere want color and art and light. So you might have a grandpa or a grandmother of 84 along with a 50-year-old and a bunch of 20-year-olds and 10-year-olds all coming and babies coming in. So we are really used to rolling with the punches. And we have separate sessions, yes, for young people because they need their own time to talk about their bodies and everything. Of course. Sorry, very different answer to your question. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's all right. I mean, I'm glad that my questions are thought-provoking, so I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, Within the research, when you, if you were to look at what young people need, do you think that judging by how complex the data that we've already gathered, do you think introducing older perspectives into it would be conducive? Because time's kind of shown that it hasn't been. But is that because of the way that we've been asking those questions and the way that we have been getting people to contribute to the conversation? Do you think there is a way that an older perspective could be influential or do you think it really is just time for the young people to kind of take over and do what's right for them? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Tricky one. Well, what made me, what I was thinking about when Sangeeta was talking was the context changes every, with every generation, right? And n none of us understand what it's like for 15 year olds today to, to live being a 15 year old today. But the emotions are the same no matter what generation you lived in. So I think we can connect at that emotional level and understand what those emo emotions mean and share those skills that we've learned in how to manage those emotions, even if the context is different. I would say that I think young people today are growing up in a society that is more challenging than it has been for many previous generations. There's challenges in any, every generation, but for young people today, there, there's a lot of pressure and globalisation has brought its own challenges, social media brings its own challenges. So, and it's important for us older, older ones to, to understand that. And we, so we need to listen to what young people are going through, and then we can, but we can help them to process those emotions in a healthy way. I think that's what's really important. Absolutely, because I, I do kind of feel that we don't really take a holistic approach to dealing with mental health typically you know it is like antidepressants or therapy or you know eat a banana and sit outside for the day in some sunshine which we very rarely get so do you think that tailoring our approach to dealing with these things prevention versus cure all the time you know is there a way that within our society that we could incorporate much more such as dance such as opening up your body and kind of identifying those emotions and how they take place within the health sector or do you think we're too west for that too western to to kind of accept that ideology shall i answer yeah, so yeah, yeah. i think it's it's happening i think it's happening very slowly and um, within the health sector i think the arts are definitely being recognized i mean i started working in the hospital 11 years ago and there was nothing nothing happening for children young people on a daily basis at that point and i had one other colleague in scotland who was doing a similar job to me um, and I had, you know, I'm, I, I'm in touch with the other children's hospital network within, um, within the UK as well. And we were all quite new in what we were doing and, and bringing the arts and bringing dance into the hospital spaces. And I remember kind of, I said to um, the director of clinical services in the hospital, I'd like to bring a dance workshop in on a weekly basis um, because I think it will help children get through their physiotherapy it's going to they have to do physiotherapy it can get really boring doing the same exercises every day but if we bring a dance artist in then they will go through their physiotherapy exercises in a fun way that the children and people don't even know they're doing dance and he went it'll never work it won't work that's ridiculous but I'm willing to give it a shot so it was we came I was really nervous bringing this artist in thinking oh my god everyone's watching and it's going to collapse and it's going to fail but they brought we brought the artist in we played loud music again it was just breaking all these rules of a hospital and we brought the kind of the loud music in and we had this dancer who had no inhibition she just danced most beautiful dancer to watch amazing and she just worked with the young people she worked at the bedsides because we don't have performance spaces so you're in a tight cubicle space so you just kind of you're working with what you've got you're working with the children what they choose again choice is really important what music do you want to listen to what are we dancing to 
and it was just transformed the whole atmosphere of the ward. It transformed those young people. But what was really powerful was the young people who couldn't leave their bed spaces, either because of their um, disability or because um, they were nonverbal or for whatever reason, they were the ones who engaged in the dance activity the most. They lit up when they heard the sound of the music. Um, our dance practitioner was using a lot of touch as part of her practice. And so those young people just, it just relaxed in the enjoyment and the pleasure they got from that experience. That the, the clinical director came to me after and went, I was wrong. It was the most powerful thing I've ever seen. And that started opening up us bringing other kind of art forms into the hospital and breaking boundaries. We have Indian dancers come in too every week and they wear bells and they are loud. They are in Indian costume, absolutely beautiful, but I'm going, oh my God, this is an infection control issue. This is going to be noisy. It's going to get on the, you know, the, the nurses are going to get really irritated by this. But again, it was embraced. And I think we're breaking, slowly breaking down these, these, preconceived ideas of what healthcare and hospital should be and how we can merge the two, the arts and the um, and clinical interventions together. And it's starting it, it, now 10 years on, it, it's very much integrated in our hospital, um, whether it's within the mental health tier four CAMS um, service or within the main body of the hospital itself. The clinicians are now using us and using our artists to go in to help them with um, certain clinical interventions that young people are struggling with. Um, I can give a, I'll give a short example. Again, this might be slightly triggering, but in our tier four CAM service, we have um, 12 beds in the tier four. It's a secure unit um, and the children there are very, very unwell. Um, it, the majority of those young people have an eating disorder. And so weigh-in times for them is extremely stressful. So the, clinic, the clinical team brought us in during and to deliver work, art workshops during the, um, the weigh-in time. So it was a, used as a distraction. It was helped to relax the young people, but it also got them together rather than them hiding in their bedrooms because they were so stressed and anxious about this. Um, and it was wonderful. We were running a 3D printing workshop where you use 3D printing pens to design and to draw. And the young people really enjoyed this activity, but over the sessions, as, as the sessions developed, the young people who found this experience so stressful of weighing started to create little tokens for each other. And they would just maybe do draw a heart shape with a 3D pen. And I remember one of them just writing proud across it. And this young person handed it to another young person as they were about to go in for their weigh-in. And it was one of the most moving moments of how powerful the arts can be. It brought those young people together and then they had that peer support that was starting to develop. And that wouldn't have happened within, without the art intervention, but it wouldn't have happened if the CAMS team hadn't have gone, this is a really stressful time for these young people. We need an arts intervention or something for those young people to help them get through these really triggering and difficult times. So I think it's happening, it is happening, not enough, but we're getting there. I think this is why we're here today, isn't it? We're talking about the work that we're all doing and how this is going to start developing and hopefully more and more and more, it, it, it's going to get integrated more and more into, into these healthcare settings and within clinical health. Absolutely, because I mean, like I deal a lot with the education and I mean, listening to music, whenever I'm stressed, headphones are on. You know, like that's, that's kind of my my outlet for when I'm feeling down and that's a, a, an instant art intervention of like I need to listen to music it makes me feel better but in certain professional environments especially within schools you know there's talks of banning mobile phones in schools and that might be great in certain ways but in other ways for people like me who actually did listen to music during certain lessons when I was working you know that's instantly taken that away from me and disadvantaging me and I do feel like there is still a really prevalent barrier between the arts and professionalism. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't really intersect the way that I think they should. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how we can really start to change that in a way that will actually be conducive to, to young people mm -hmm. and beyond. Because it isn't just a young person's issue either. You know, there will be adults sat in here today thinking, I really actually just want to listen to music. You know, like I actually just want to go into the, see the cinema or do something more artistic. Than going to work your nine to five. So I definitely think there is 
there's scope for that to develop. Do either of you have anything that you'd like to weigh in on? <laughs> I just I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think from an education perspective, it's really important to recognise what great work teachers are doing in schools. <laughs> so it's not about bashing teachers, it's more about just thinking more holistically about what education can mean and how we can best balance the sort of well-being needs of young people uh, with their academic needs within a sort of school setting. And I think from that perspective, like you've just illustrated with the mobile phone example, that's there's a lot of work to do and there's a lot we don't quite understand yet. So um, still keep me in a research job for a little while. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to add one more thing. Um, and I, this is something that I feel is has worked a lot with a whole range of young people that have worked, thousands that have worked in the last couple of decades, and that is volunteerism. So if you find creative ways, for me, art is not bound by dance or theater or visual arts, right? It is to engage creatively with the world around you. And um, I think for all of us, volunteering our time, finding a sense of purpose and finding worth that we have something that we can give back is very important in the growth, in your growth sector. I know that um, we've done some studies on uh, looking at a range of volunteers from the ages of even like nine or 10 till the age of 18 and what that contributes to their lives. And we found that in areas in North Chennai, which is, uh, Chennai is one of the cities I, I was born and brought up, and North Chennai is very poor drugs, a very industrialized, very polluted, there's high levels of mercury in the ground, typhoid, TB, you have, it, it is a very unhealthy part of town, right? And the kids that grow up there are growing up with all these risks, but also higher levels of domestic violence, alcoholism, substance abuse, name it. We found that if uh, in the groups of kids that we worked with, kids that stepped up and wanted to volunteer with us and, and were much less likely to engage in substance abuse. We're much more likely to uh, feel worthy and build their confidence and be able to speak in public, for example, explain this particular project. Uh, one kid just decided that the drainage, every time it rained, we would be walking through hip deep water. He actually designed, you know, where the drainage is a, a device that would, would hang from the lid. So when the water came up to a certain level, it would ring a bell in the, uh, in the department, the plumbing, the water department. They can do stuff. You just need to give them that door to manifest their creativity, you know. And volunteering, non-transactional relationships are so important when you're growing up because we are growing up in an extremely transactional world. When I have a 14-year-old kid saying, so what will you give me for that? I'm like, you'll get nothing and you'll get everything. Because we are told that our worth is measured in your salary, uh, uh, especially for boys. The amount they earn in India is their value you bring into your family. It's related. Uh, you, who do you respect? The guy who's flying a jet, who has his own personal jet, or the guy who's walking to... It's true. There's so much emphasis on money and financial transaction. We forget all the other kinds of capital. Love capital, compassion capital, fun capital, positivity capital, joy capital, and those multiply. It doesn't diminish. If I give you money, I have less. If I give you love, I have thousands more, right? So. I also think these are the pillars we should be building into every program. So all our programs, when we work with young people, will fold into the next step is, do you want to come back and work on a, you know, as a peer leader or as a contributor to something? We always give them that opportunity to give back. And it is such a joy. I was in Manipur, which is now a state in India, which has war happening, this ethnic conflict, and nobody in the rest of the world knows about it. Even in India, half of us are not, don't care. And I was working with young boys who were sent to the front lines uh, as volunteers. But, you know, they have guns, they're on the front lines in the buffer zone, in the, you know, between them, they're seeing their enemies across. So any space can become a space of intervention. So I would just climb up the mountain with them. And I had really bad shoes, and it was a raining season. When I would come down, I would slide down on my butt because my shoes, I would just slip all the time. My back was hurting, so I just paddled my way down the mountain. And that one journey of two hours of sliding my butt down was a huge way for young men to help me, right, get down. And then they would talk about the music they were listening to. I would love to. And, and they were talking about the, the relatives who had fled. They were talking about the houses that were burned. But they were also laughing their heads off at this 
woman that you know was sliding down the mountain on her butt you know so every opportunity to give back to say i am a source of help is important absolutely and i think when you're saying that we're kind of grown up in a very transactional era absolutely i mean the cost of living crisis is so prevalent and it's really sad that there is almost a need or like an ingrained kind of mindset of i must get something back from this and i do feel like volunteering has kind of been diminished especially and in Brickleid, it's not as popular and there aren't as many opportunities to volunteer because it is seen as, what am I going to get for it? And even in schools, the culture that we promote is like, you do this and it'll look good on your CV. You do this and you'll get into uni for it. It's a great experience for you. We're not teaching young people to give. We're touching, like we're not touching, we're definitely not touching young people. We're teaching young people to give and receive, you know? Um, and I think that's... The number of likes you have on a post, the number of influence, it's, everything is quantified and, and the best things in life cannot be quantified. Absolutely. Sorry. No, that's okay. I think now's really a great time to open up the floor, the space to anyone who might have any comments or questions. Rona, I think you'd said there'd been a few pre-submitted ones. But please, please get involved if there's anything that you want to say, anything you want to disagree with. You know, this is an open space to... So they're going to pass out some paper to you all. If you would like to say anything, signal, signal them. But of course, while that is happening, um, I'm going to tell you just a wee bit, talk a wee bit more about what SYP are doing. So I, um, as well as in... MSYP. I'm also the convener of the Health, Wellbeing and Sports Committee. And one of the Scottish Youth Parliament, in case you're not familiar, the Scottish Youth Parliament is the democratically elected body of Scottish young people. Um, we are working on three national campaigns and one of those is kind of introducing better, more conducive mental health training to youth workers, health practitioners, teachers, so that young people are... They're, they're met with early intervention to a point where they don't even have to get referred to CAMS. Because something that is, is kind of the main talking point is, oh, the CAMS waiting lists, the waiting lists, it's this, that and the other. And there's so many reasons why that may be. But for me, I'm thinking, why are so many people getting referred to CAMS? Like, of course, CAMS is a service and it's great for those who need it and they get it immediately, but most people don't. But the problem is, why do they need that immediate support? Obviously, it's been proven that we don't have the budgets and the facility to help every young person when they need it. What can we do to prevent more young people getting, in, getting onto those waiting lists? So myself, my deputy convener, uh, we went to the Scottish Parliament, or what was it, Butte House? St Andrew's House? One of the houses. St Andrew's House. Um, and we spoke to some of the director generals of the government, and I was lucky enough to speak to the CEO of NHS Scotland to just say to her, by the way, this is what young people are thinking, this is how we're feeling. These are the issues that we've identified. How does that make you feel? Are you aware of these issues? And she was lovely, don't get me wrong, she was lovely, we had a great conversation, but immediately she said, you know, if you need instant support, you can phone 111, and there's fully trained medical, mental health practitioners on the phone. And for her, that was just a reasonable response. But the reality is, if you are in a dire time, you've not got that kind of self-advocation to phone someone and say, I need help, and to wait half an hour on hold to then speak to someone who's going to hand you over to someone else. And I think identifying that is seeing that there is the barrier where she thinks that's totally acceptable and that's her solution, where really that's not at all. Um, so we are, we're doing lots, we're doing lots, and we're doing and we're facilitating lots of spaces where young people can kind of contribute their ideas, their own experiences. And then as the Scottish Youth Parliament, we collate all that data and then we go and do things about it. So a lot of what we do is advocating, which I love. But even just going back to the transactional thing, the reason I was told to get into this was because it would look great on my UCAS. Um, and that's not why I'm in it now. I don't need to be here, but I like being here. Um, but do you think there is a way, just before we get these questions in, do you think there is a way that we can try and change that culture of you're doing this for you rather than you're doing this for someone else, but you will also get joy from it? Do you know what I'm saying? The volunteer culture. The volunteering culture, yeah. No, I, I agree. It is very transactional. I was just thinking, my daughter actually does a lot of volunteering and we have huge amounts of volunteers um, in our hospital. Um, but I was just going back from a young person point of view. If she does so many volunteer hours, she gets points through um, that she can then trade for money off things, do you know what I mean? And so that is 
that's not why she does it. She does it because she wants to help. But it is very <laughs> transactional. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, or people do it for DV, don't they? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to... I'm going, I'm going to put you two on the spot. You two, are, okay. <laughs> this is Audrey and Sheila, and Audrey and Sheila are volunteers within our charity. Um, Audrey volunteers in our hospital shop, and Sheila volunteers at our mental health service, The Haven. And for you, I, I, I'm going to ask you, is it transactional? Is it, it, what, I mean, other than the fact that you're getting joy from being able to contribute, but the reasons why you volunteer, what are they? I'm thinking, you're gonna, I know you're going to kill me at the end of this, sorry. I enjoy working in the shop because I like the people and I like talking, talking to the people and, and helping, you know, because they do need volunteers to run the shop, which is very successful. Yes, because so, without our volunteers yeah. in the shop, we wouldn't be able to run our shop and therefore the NHS aren't getting the, the food they need or the families aren't getting the, the food that they need throughout their day. Um, and so we rely heavily on our volunteers. And yeah, I, and yeah, I don't, I don't know whether it is ultra, maybe for young people, but certainly not for your generation, I don't think being... But there are some young people who do volunteer in the shop that's true. Yeah. on a Friday afternoon, you know, when they finish school. And obviously they, they get something out of it as well as... And I just think how great they are doing exams and coming in yeah. to do that. Maybe we're underestimating. Maybe we are. I mean, my mind was kind of just Thank obviously, you. I'm not going to get party political, but there was recent headlines where one of the political parties spoke about mandating voluntary service for young people. And through the circles that I network in, that was not well received because mandatory volunteering isn't, it, it's contradictory, yes. in my opinion. <laughs> um, you know, you can't mandate voluntary work. Um, and I do feel that even just with those headlines, young people were instantly opposed to that. Why would I want to volunteer? Why would I want to do something that I'm not going to get paid to do? You know, um, and personally, I disagreed with it, not maybe for the reasons that every other young person disagreed for it. Um, but I mean, it, people, there is an opinion that volunteering is exploitative. But I think that does come down from the culture of transaction. Mm. It's like we're exploiting you because you're not getting monetary value. I don't know if we do do enough work to see that young people will get much more out of volunteering than just points or just a good CV. There is the fine line, isn't there, between mm -hmm. kind of, because we have this debate quite a lot, it's kind of, where's the fine line between that should be an employed job and that should be a volunteering role? Yeah. And there is a fine line between the two. Um, but what you are doing, we see with many of the volunteers who come through our service, is that, especially our young volunteers, they're upskilling. And even if they're with us for a few months, the, the, they will come back to us and go, this experience has been amazing. I have learned so much. It's been wonderful being a part of this team. Um, and because of this, I've now been able to get the, the job that I really wanted, or I've been able to get onto the university course that I wanted, and I wouldn't have been able to do that without the volunteering. But, you know, and a lot of these young people will stay on because they actually have loved the experience so much. Um, yeah. So I don't know. That's a very important point with volunteering is it is upskilling in yeah. a sense, right? I still spend, honestly, more than 90% of my work is unpaid. I'm a volunteer. I don't state it because that I'm not given respect. So the entire culture has to change. Mm -hmm. Normally volunteers means you don't have skill in it and you're not really great at it and you're doing it out of the goodness of your heart, yeah. right? But I think one of the themes we're working on, we started this organization called Volunteer for India uh, and then we handed it over to three volunteers and now they're running it and they're thousands of people across India who are doing it and getting enormous connections. Mm -hmm. You get connection, you get a sense of purpose, and you get more skill, you know. I think we are deviating from the topic, but I feel strategies like these work with mental health because it makes you feel value, yes. it gives you confidence, and uh, society sees you differently, you know. So, and volunteers are very creative because you're hit with all kinds of situations. Yeah. You have to deal with it with creative strategies. Well, it's interesting because there's a psychological theory called self-determination theory, which uh -huh. talks about the basic psychological needs that are fundamental to all of us, and there's three of them, which mm -hmm. you've just mentioned. Oh. So relatedness, having that connection with other people, competence, so being in a position to gain and develop your skills, and the third one 
is agency. So about decision making and being able to make a difference both yourself and to other people's lives. So, you, and you've just described all three <laughs> from your experience of that work. So I think that's really important because that links to how we feel about ourselves and our, our mental well-being, having that opportunity for growth, personal growth, for connection and for making a difference. Well, that rounds us off really nicely to, to ask some of these questions. The first one, to what extent is a part of children's mental health services to facilitate adults in positions of power to listen, relinquish power and open up to other possibilities as suggested by young people and artists? So that's Can you say yeah. that again? Yeah. yeah. To what extent is it a part of children's mental health services to facilitate adults in positions of power to listen, relinquish power and open up to other possibilities as suggested by young people and artists? Whoever asked this, would you like to... You don't have to, but would you like to delve a wee bit further? There we go. Hello. Hi. We're bringing you a mic, I think, unless you really want to shout. You're happy shouting. Okay, no worries. <laughs> oh, we're recording, so you will need to speak, sorry. Hi, thank you so much. It's been so interesting. Um, I guess I'm interested, I, I'm 26 and I'm now coming out of being a young person and coming into adulthood. And something that I've noticed a lot through my life is um, adults in positions of power struggling to listen to young people and struggling to relinquish power, believing that they know the best way to do things. Um, and often that not suiting young people and their needs and this kind of stuff. And I guess it's a self-serving question to a certain degree because I also want to hear from you uh, any examples that you know of or any work that you've done that has helped adults to relinquish some of that power over believing that, that they know what's best. How do we help adults listen to young people and how important do you think that is in the work that you do? Fabulous. Who would like to start off with that? Um, it, it, that's absolutely everything we do is around the children, young people and in consultation with children, young people. It is vital that the, we listen. We have to listen to what our young people are asking for us to do or we're going to just be doing like delivering to them rather than for them. And I think that's a very different thing. Um, we developed um, a mental health service um, which we're piloting out in East Lothian at the moment called The Haven and all of that work, we spent two years developing that project before we, um, we, before we launched it. But we spent all of that time consulting with people we consulted with, the doctors and teachers and the local communities. We consulted with the families most importantly, um, and the children, young people who were struggling with their mental health, what do you need? What's going to be useful? What isn't useful? What is what has your journey been so far that we can learn from you so that we can tailor this experience and this service to suit what you need rather than what we think you should have? And I think this is where certain mental health services aren't working quite so well for families um, and for young people. Um, but the service that we are doing literally has been tailored. Families said they wanted a drop-in service, somewhere they could go when they felt like they had nowhere else to turn. So that's what we provided. Young people were saying they wanted the opportunity to be able to, you know, have peer support. So we have teenage youth group kind of um, time within our, within our service. Um, young people, some families said they didn't want a structured course teaching them how to look after their children or um, look at the different um, techniques for, for good mental health. Whereas other families who are at the beginning of their, their mental health journey or their CAMS journey were saying, we desperately want help. So we give options. Some families can join if, in if they want to um, and young people can take those courses. If you don't want to, that's okay. Um, we, we're not going to force it upon anybody. We try to be as flexible as possible because that's what we were being told by the families and by the young people and actually by the professionals as well, that that's what was needed. Um, so I think it's really, it's so important to listen to what people are asking and what their needs are because actually it was one of the, the CAMS nurses who said to me, we desperately need a drop-in service and I was like, oh, I'm not sure about that. Kind of, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, then we just don't know who's coming through the door and is that going to be safe and everything. But then when the families and the young people go, we just want to be able to drop in as and when we need to, 
But you go, OK, well, that's what's been asked for. That's what we're going to deliver. And so, yeah, I, I hope that's answered your question a little bit. But I do think it's so important that we, we listen and we need to make sure that, you, you know, the, the GPs and our doctors and our clinicians and the people with power really listen to the young people's voices because you know what you're talking about you know we kind of like I say I was a young person 20 plus years ago and and I don't know what you're going through and it's and you have a voice and young people are so intelligent and so interesting and and even kind of our little three-year-olds who come running into our service they tell us something and it's and it's important to them and it's it's important for us to listen and respond respectfully to those to everybody with parents. I work a lot with women, with men, with adults and one of the biggest missions is do not impose what you feel because in India the fight is about security. They want their girls to marry into good families with financial security and they want their boys to go into professions that will provide financial security. That's the community I'm working with, right? So this is abuse. This is violence. We define domestic violence as pushing your children to do what you think is best for them. This is violence. So when we do our sessions, we just, we're doing these sessions across hundreds of communities in Tamil Nadu now. Uh, with, we're doing it with a lot of uh, women and men. And the first thing when we say we're doing domestic violence is there is of course the beating and the emotional violence, but pushing your children to do what is best for them, that you think is best for them is violence. So there's lots of conversations around that. How do you help your children find their voice and agency? And that has to be part of your conversation. And they want to do it because they know that the relationship with their children will blossom, that they will have more love and support and connection. But they're also scared. You know, I let my daughter out later at night to go for a tuition, which she wants to take in order to write these exams. Will she be safe? What will the neighbors say? Will they comment on her modesty? Mm -hmm. Will my son be safe? So you're addressing not a logistic problem, it's an emotional problem. So we also have to be aware of that because parents, you know, they have their concerns too. Thank you. Thank you. The next question that I've got here, um, in schools, sport is valued, but the arts is much less so. How can this attitude of value be changed to benefit all young people? So I think, like, I'm actually going to touch on that a little bit. So I was really lucky to go to high school where a lot of the investment had went into the music department. So I was thriving in school and we had the facilities to make our own music, to learn music. We had lots of different instruments and it was fantastic. But my friends went to another school where their music department was god-awful but they had a great sports department. So they were thriving um, with their swimming pool and everything. But of course, when you're in an area, you kind of just go to the school that your catchment is in, you know, you don't get to really choose. Um, so of course, I was very lucky as a musician to be in Clyde View. She wasn't so much because she had to travel to get to our school to learn, I think it was like xylophone or something that isn't ma like majorly popular. But there absolutely is an attitude that there's so many opportunities for sports, especially football, for boys. But there aren't as many opportunities to get into a band. And I mean, Inverclyde, the music culture is actually really prevalent. And I keep talking about music, I obviously do identify arts as being a much greater thing. Um, but music is something I'm really passionate about. Um, but I mean, there's so many facilities outside of education to go and practice in Inverclyde. But the same can't be said for Stornoway or for Sky, where there isn't much really happening in that sector. So what do you think, in your experience, obviously in your different fields, how do you think we can change that attitude? And do you think that attitude, attitude is as prevalent outside of the education? Do you think it really just is a school thing and then when you come out of it, there is much more opportunities or do you think it's something that kind of carries on? question isn't it who wants um, to take it because i know that is quite a beefy question i think my thinking around this was um if you have young people or a child who's interested in music or a child who's interested in sport a lot of the activities that the school offer after school are sports and they're free to access if you have a child who is interested in music or dance or perform performing arts you're generally having to pay 
for that tuition, that, uh, that additional, you know, for the arts. So the only way for us to be able to do that is to make, to make arts and sports more equal, I think, is to be providing more after school arts activities that, um, that are free because then it just becomes that small pocket of young people who are able, whose families who are able to afford tuition and it's expensive that are going to enable those young people to then carry on through the arts to their career. Um, that is just my thought actually as a parent rather than as a professional, but yeah, I don't know what you think. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one, isn't it? And schools have such limited resources and they're often just dependent on the teachers in the school and what they're able to provide. And my kids happily go to high school where they've got a brilliant music and drama department, which is great because my daughter uh, enjoys those and they're also quite, they've got some, a good sports department too. So it is possible to balance both, but, but perhaps it's, it's about, um, yeah, this sort of national investment because I'm thinking around sport, we've got, Sport Scotland has created a whole network of active school coordinators which, who support schools around sports and they really invest at primary level and then that trickles on through to secondary where it's often picked up by PE teachers. Um, there isn't that sort of national infrastructure or investment around the arts mm -hmm. and so there aren't those specialists around schools to support teachers in delivering arts activities. So I think it does come down to resources and it's really important to realise that there's not an equal playing field. So yet, like you say, um, not all children have access to the same opportunities and that's something we really need to look at and, and address. Absolutely. Um, and also just to touch on it before I come over to you, um, you know, as someone who does play music and is quite involved with other musicians, a lot of the time when we are asked to perform or to volunteer, our talent and our livelihoods is almost taken for granted. It's like, you know, you can play guitar, so why don't you just teach guitar? You know, and even though, as you were saying, it's a lot paid, I think it is important that people are paid for what they're contributing. Oh, yeah. But is there a problem where we live in a society where they can't afford to volunteer because they do need an income? You know, is it that actually the poverty is so real that they cannot afford to not do that as a fully career? How can we shift that? so that they've got the means able to say, yes, I can absolutely do this, run these classes for free. I'm not expecting a payment. I'm not ex expecting that transaction. Is it because the world is in such a way where people are using food banks or working nine to five? You know, like, w what is the issue there? Because sports, there's a lot of, I could name three sports clubs that are voluntary. You know, like we go and we go to the field and we just play football, that's, that's easy. Whereas when you're a musician or you're a dancer, you need certain shoes, you know, you need certain instruments. If you're an artist, you need your materials, which can be expensive. Whereas with sports, not always, not always, and I'm also not an expert on sports, but football is, you know, I, I would say that, and maybe this is just really ignorant, but I would say that is more accessible than playing violin, for instance. Do you think there is something that we could do to change society in a way where artists can can give more back to their community? Do you think that would solve the issue? No, I think it's just, uh, we all need a seismic shift. We know that when budget cuts happen, first thing that cuts is arts. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the Olympics for the sports, sports are valued, you have national teams. You don't have the same value for the arts, right? Um, it's considered soft, it's a soft skill, it's something you pay for if you want to give your child the opportunity, right? It's an elitist skill, uh, you know, and certain sports are elitist, like tennis is definitely way more, you know, you need, it's not as accessible as a football, but I find football and cricket extremely patriarchal. It is not gender neutral. In fact, I, I, I actively don't support, I'm sorry, maybe it's a national heresy to say that, I don't support football and cricket in our village. We support other sports because otherwise other genders cannot even enter the space. There's no space. And it's, um, I'm not blaming football. It's like you don't blame an art form or a sport. You blame the culture that has developed over generations and that we are unconsciously, through publicity, through the way we market it, through the amount of money and the, the image that is associated around it, it, it is, um, I find it extremely unhealthy, you know. So I would actively say that I think we need to rethink sports and the arts on massive levels to bring in parity and equity. Everybody's talking about diversity, equity, inclusion. 
are you telling me the sports are diverse, that there's equity and inclusion? I don't think so. Women's Sports Day, so I mean that should be enough. That's that box ticked that you know when schools girls will get it's taken It's like out this their tokenism, and, right? You know, this token thing that you throw out. But it's also got to do with our choices. The fact that women wear tighter clothes, that being um, uh, being uh, a particular way privileges you. You know, it's got to do with body image. It's got to do with so many things that we as conscious people can change. That we can don't buy dolls for our girls and cars for our boys. I mean, I, I'm stating the obvious and I'm most, most probably speaking to the converted here. So I'm not going to go on about it. But I think it's a social that we all need to engage with these questions, you know, on what is, uh, what is appropriate for, for us and what we want our children to be able to access. And I think what's beautiful in Scotland, and we definitely don't have in India, is that as micro communities, a lot of times you have agency. You can work for your community to build a particular space or there are, there's fundings you can tap in into your hospital or whatever to try and build that extra space, which we don't have that option, uh, opportunity in India. So I'm learning a lot here. Thank you. I know, because that's a great point. Like, we're such a, we are a rich country and on paper we really shouldn't have to discuss this. We, we shouldn't be here discussing mental health and, and arts because we should, on paper have facilities to just curb that problem altogether. Um, so it is really, really interesting and like I'm so grateful that you're here to give us that balanced perspective because Scotland's doing all right, but you look at other places and you think, actually, we're, I'm sat here kind of complaining when I'm actually very, very, I should be much more grateful for what we've got, even though there is issues within our systems. Um, but the last point I'm going to touch on right now, because I would like to ask a few more questions and then potentially give back. In fact, never mind, we've got 10 minutes, so maybe not. Um, someone has written in, for myself, I feel the process is already happening. So I'm not sure when this note was written and I'm not sure what process you're talking about. Would you, do you feel comfortable explaining this a wee bit better? Brilliant. Hi, sorry, I'm the sports coach at the VNA Youth Club in Nitrogen in Livingston, but I'm also the youth development worker. Everything that you spoke about today, hi. Um, actually, like the volunteers, the development of the children, arts, sports, um, but that's actually obviously came as a catalyst. Obviously, I'm the sports coach, so I've used sports as a catalyst. There's some things that I've obviously I've listened to, like you've said, like sports accessible and free in schools. That is not the case, that is not true. And I think, sports and arts actually play together because like, obviously as a sports person and I, as obviously I tell the children and youths when you're actually devising a session plan that's creativity everything in life's to do with creativity so obviously you're drawing you're making sure the session plan goes through all this stuff it's so i think both of them is like hand in hand and obviously you said about the violin as well like obviously the, the equipment see playing sports see like football you said football that's very expensive to get into because when you're in a deprived area, people can't afford football boots. They can't afford the memberships to join, like obviously uh, clubs and stuff. And that's a real problem in West Lothian, where we're from. Um, and that's, that, that's I feel really strong about that. That's when I heard you. I just want to make sure that the children knew that I spoke for them because obviously that wasn't true what you were speaking. So that's why I had to say that there. Yeah, absolutely, thank um, you. I welcome that completely. Yeah, honestly, like, um, yeah, but the arts, like, I agree with you. Dance and stuff like that is, but I think, obviously mental health is huge. But for myself, I think when you look at someone as a whole and you develop them as a whole, that's when mental health actually gets improved. I think instead of actually just concentrating and saying mental health, I think looking at someone overall picture actually will improve it a whole lot more because where we've done it, we've already started that process within the last year. Does that make sense? So everything you've spoke about, we're all there, they started it and we're, we've already seen the actual figures in the children, obviously the, everyone's just thriving. So I think, I don't know if there's a bit of misconception or a bit of misinformation, but there's a link from actually the communities that are actually already doing it, that you are thinking it's not, and you're starting a project that's, I think there's a, the relationships, there's not a link. So we actually don't know what's actually going on in the actual places itself. Does that, does that make sense? It absolutely does. I can only go by what I've heard from today, and I had to make sure that I had to speak for ourselves and obviously the children, because obviously you're saying that you want to do this, but we're actually already doing it. So there has to be a link from local to authorities to obviously government level, because there's obviously a miscommunication somewhere. Absolutely, and it, quickly, just before we 
I'll let you um, take the floor. Like, when I work with lots of different MSYPs from all across Scotland, what we do in Inverclyde is completely different to what they do in Glasgow Province. You know, and there isn't that communication there between what I'm saying may be true for Inverclyde is absolutely not true from what you're saying. And you're absolutely right in saying that there is... You know, elements, yeah, absolutely. Without a shadow of a doubt, I've been doing community art since I was 18, and um, and we've all been doing that work and supporting young people um, in that capacity. Whether it's through sports, whether it's through the arts, whether it's through youth work, which basically, you know, let's be honest, whether you're an artist or kind of a, a sports coach, you are doing youth work as well. Um, and this is happening, and it has been happening for years and years and years. And if it wasn't for those groups of, of like yourselves and the other kind of arts organisations and other sports groups or scouting or anything who are delivering that and delivering well-being, um, I, I think our children would be far worse off than they actually currently are because they, these groups are absolutely vital. I think when I was talking about our service, the difference and what makes us very different is that we're talking about we are supporting the whole family, including siblings and including, and it's very specifically around children's mental health and, the, and psychological techniques that help children who are, you know, to, really struggling with anxiety or low mood or suicidal thoughts um, with real specific techniques um, to, to support them building that resilience. But it goes hand in hand we work with also the sports, sporting community groups around as well. We can't do our jobs in silo. We have to work together and we have to draw from what those children, young people need. So we might have a young person coming in and go, which I have in the past, I, I, I love football. And we go, right, well, let's, we'll take you, we'll link you up. And, and so we link up with those other partner organisations. Or there might be another person go, I really love knitting. Well, let's find a knitting group that they can go to. So we're not just holding those young people and just kind of doing what we do. We're actually going, we're taking you and we're going to take you and we're going to find those different um, organisations who can support what you need. Um, but we're always going to be here to support from, from the mental health and psychological point of view. But it's important that every organisation, grassroots organisations, small charities, um, voluntary groups, that we all work together to support the whole community and to support children and young people on their different journeys. So I didn't mean it to kind of sound like it wasn't happening because I, I know it's happening but it's how we need to start connecting with each other more to, to make sure that we're really working for the children and young people who need us and need our support. Does, does that help? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, quickly, we have got five minutes, so to keep it as brief as possible, I would just love to know, through everything, all the work that you have completed, what's been the highlight? Earlier today, we spoke about what kind of got you into it, why were you passionate, and how did you fall into your line of work? What's been the highlight of this, from everything that you've contributed to young people, to older people, to wider society, even to the room today? And I'll start with you, if that's OK. Yes, gosh. Well, I don't work within an arts context, so I can speak from a research perspective. And I think what's exciting for me is, is that research has shifted and it's less about doing research on young people. It's more now about doing research with young people. So bringing, we've talked about young people's voice and whether that's bringing that into sort of community-based work or whether it's bringing it into research. I think that's really powerful and exciting. So that would be my, that would be my sort of takeaway, I suppose, is working together to, you know, to bring everybody's perspectives together, to create that sense of agency and empowerment and find the solutions from, from within. It's not about a sort of professional sorting out the problems for a young person. It's about creating that community of support around a young person and finding those workable solutions together. So, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> it is really, it's a really hard question <laughs> because there's never one highlight, right? I want to say the first thing that pops in. Um, we live... Uh, in a world that is very unequal and, uh, and very often young people as they are growing, they are watching and they are absorbing hierarchies, they are absorbing who has power. We are all absorbing how, where we fit in, right? And I think when I have sessions where at the end of it, people are coming up to me and saying, um, 
I learned something today and I want to pass it on. That for me is, is powerful because so much of it is about paying it forward. And the more we pay it forward, like I, I love the fact when she spoke about sports and the sports clubs we do, we do ultimate frisbee. And we have spirit circles at the end when after a very intense game, it's been very competitive. But we get all the teams to sit together and talk about what they could have done better, what the other team could have done better. What, when we have an opportunity to, to flatten the space, bring in healthy competition, but also the fact that to be in this space, we are very privileged to be up in whatever level. I'm sometimes talking to the poorest of the poor and living in, in terrible conditions. But if they are inspired to say, I want to go back and tell my sisters about what I learned today, you know, or I want to go back and start a little uh, games club or a little art activity, that for me is one of the biggest, yeah, gifts that we want to pay forward. Thank you. Fiona? Um, for me, it is, so I was in the CAMS inpatient unit on Wednesday and we were actually delivering a workshop with Dynamic Earth and we had our set up around the table and uh, a few young people joined in. There was young, one young person who was sitting off to the side and I said, do you want to come and join in? She's like, no, no. So, okay, so we just left her. And just every now and again, we'd just glance over and you could see that she was watching. You could see that she, she was kind of interested in what was going on. So after maybe I left it maybe 20 minutes and just to gauge whether she was being interested or just glancing. And I thought, do you know what, I'm going to take this fossil across. We had some coprolite, which is fossilised dinosaur poo. You can't go wrong with poo. Um, so we took that across. So I just took it across and I went, well, what, feel that, it's really heavy. What do you think it is? And, uh, and I said, I'm going to leave it with you and just have, it, just have a think about it. And then I just walked away. And then, you know, a couple of minutes later, I kind of went back with another material, but I went, so what did you think? What, what did you find? You know, I just went, oh, I don't know. It looks a bit like a brain or something. And so we talked about the fossilised poo, and then we talked about the, you can, from that, you can discover what the dinosaurs were eating. And I think it's interesting that we had these kind of, I said, oh, check these out, these little cards that kind of come to life. And you scan your phone or an iPad over it, and it turns into this AR kind of virtual reality thing. It's really cool. Obviously, all from Dynamic Earth. This is not my area of expertise, but I, I'll lap it all up. It's brilliant. And she then just slowly starts to engage. So from, from being kind of like turned away, you know, you see these young people slowly starting to edge and, and turn towards you and, and slowly starting to then engage with the activity that you're doing. And for me, that is the moment. That is the, what makes what we do worthwhile. It, it's kind of those just... She chose to engage in her own time, in her own way, and what we don't want to do is put any pressure on, on her or anyone to engage, but it's just seeing those moments of, yeah, I, I'm, I didn't have the confidence, but now I'm, I'm going to do it, and I love those moments. Thank you, and thank you so much for joining me on this panel today. It's been great hearing everything that you've got to say, everything that you do and everything you contribute. Um, and I'm just I'm amazed to be surrounded by such powerful, successful women, and yeah, thank you. And thank you everyone for coming as well. So I actually have got a wee bit of a, a script to say. Rona, have I got time to say it? Yeah. Um, thank you all for your contributions to the event. And um, before we close, oh, hang on. I've, we've already done that. Sorry. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, thank you to Fiona O'Sullivan, Dr. Joe Inchley and Sangeeta Ishvaran for their insightful discussions and our partners at Healing Arts Scotland and the Scottish Youth Parliament. Can I also remind everyone to fill in the survey you will receive automatically if you booked via the Eventbrite or we have a few paper copies of the survey at the back of the venue um, because we very much appreciate your thoughts on how to improve the festival. And may I take this opportunity to remind you all that there are still a few more festival events taking place today. These include a panel discussion with the Scottish Youth Scottish Parliament at 25 years, which one of my fellow MSYPs, Olivia Brown, will be presenting. So I do hope that you'll be joining us. And really, thank you so much for remaining so engaged and listening to everything that we've got to say. Um, it can be a lot of time to spend listening, um, but it's been great. You've been a great audience, so I really do appreciate it. So thank you. <laughs>